Welcome to the NWAETC Project ECHO. I'm Kent Unruh, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Harrington to introduce our guest. Thanks very much, Kent. Yes, indeed, Brian is on the other side of the globe, so I'm in his stead here today. And uh, we're, we're fortunate and glad to have Nina Kim, who I think has spoken here at Project ECHO previously, to speak on isolated hepatitis B core antibodies. Nina is an associate professor of medicine here at the university and a talented hepatitis and HIV provider. And uh, this is a vexing issue, so we're anxious to hear what she has to say about this topic. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Bob. Yeah, so Brian asked me to uh, talk about this. It's a uh, not uncommonly encountered uh, serologic profile that we see and um, can be a source of confusion for clinicians. And so hopefully by the end of the talk, you, you guys will have a little more clarity. I'm just going to touch on some virology and definitions, um, talk about the scenarios when we see, where we see this profile, um, and really the clinical significance, particularly when it comes to immunizing these folks. And um, when we talk about clinical significance, of course, we have to talk about occult hepatitis B in this setting. And then finally, we'll go over some practical considerations, which is you know, going over what the guidelines say. So as you can see here, this is basically the schema of the hepatitis B virus. And there are three main proteins. The surface antigen, as you know, is the lipoprotein that is part of the viral envelope. And it is essentially our marker of chronic persistent infection. And it is the, basically the target for the neutralizing antibody. So surface antibody is basically targeting this. There are two proteins that are part of the nucleocapsid, the core antigen and the E antigen. E antigen has been linked with kind of a marker of infectivity. Core antigen, it's the antibody, the core antigen that, that we'll be discussing today. So when we look at, the, uh, this is basically the serologic pattern that we see with acute hepatitis B when someone goes on to resolve their infection and you can see all the viral markers, the HPV DNA level, the hep B surface antigen, and the E antigen can all peak in the, at the time of the, um, the infection and will eventually, if the immune system is vigorous enough to take care of it, subside over time. And you can see that the, core, the total core <coughs> antibody shows up actually fairly early, um, both initially in the form of an IgM that can subside in acute infection. Um, but the total core antibody should generally remain stable and, and present and detectable in most individuals who have naturally encountered the virus. Um, but ultimately, it is the um, antibody to the surface anti antigen that is our marker of immunity. Um, so this is uh, it's kind of a, a representation here. So the antibody is, is all, all it tells us is the patient has encountered the virus naturally. It doesn't really play a direct role in, in immunity. So what are the situations, well, before I talk about that, um, so the definition of an isolated core antibody is essentially when we send a hepatitis B panel, we're looking at surface antigen, surface antibody, and core antibody, which represents total um, IgM, I'm, IgM and IgG. And it's essentially uh, an isolated core profile is someone who just has positive core antibody in the absence of a detectable surface antibody or surface antigen. Depending on the case series you look at, um, in the HIV population, you, encounter, you can encounter this in as often as 20 to 45 percent of the time. The factors that are associated with this profile are HIV infection, uh, certainly, um, chronic hepatitis C, very commonly encountered uh, profile in this population. Um, we can tend to see this a little bit more often in, in folks who are older um, and who've had, if they are HIV infected, CD4 counts less than 100. And there has been one study that has actually shown that antiretroviral therapy makes it less likely that we'll encounter this profile, which I thought was kind of interesting. Um, the, this has not been as well mapped out as some of these other factors, probably because there are sort of temporal issues whenever you're looking at antiretroviral therapy in studies. So when do we see this profile? Theoretically, there are four scenarios in which you can see isolated core antibody. The first is a, a window phase, um, which I'm going to go back here into our serology. So there is theoretically a period of time when um, the surface antigen has basically uh, gotten to below detectable levels and the surface antibody has not yet uh, quite developed. And it is in the seronegative window where you can sometimes just see an isolated core antibody. Keep in mind that 
we don't really encounter this window phase very often. It's a very f uh, discrete period of time um, in an individual who likely has other uh, clinically apparent manifestations of acute hep B. So, you know, so it is a scenario, but not something you guys are going to be encountering very often. The other scenario is you have someone who has seen hepatitis B and resolved, they've gone on to resolve their infection, but they've basically had waning of their surface antibody to a level that's uh, below our limit of you know, what we count as immunity, which is less than 10 uh, international units. And then you can, you can have chronic infection that can manifest as an isolated core. And uh, essentially, this is the cult hepatitis B infection, which is um, the surface antigen has escaped detection, either because they've, um, it has also waned over time uh, due to low production. We can sometimes see this in chronic carriers, that they've started to gain some better immune control and therefore lost their surface antigen. Or they have developed mutations to the envelope protein that have escaped detection by our standard assays. So that's something um, certainly to keep in mind uh, because they're, you know, like, like HIV, hepatitis B has poor fidelity in terms of replication. You can develop a lot of mutations if there's a uh, drug or immune pressure. And then you can encounter isolated core antibody just because it's a false positive. Um, and they've actually never been exposed to hepatitis B. Um, and certainly, you know, in our, <laughs> in our HIV population, one can make an argument that this is less likely to be false than true positive given the risk factors of our population. But also keep in mind that there is some degree of immune dysregulation and uh, B cell stimulation. And so it's not, um, it's not out of the realm of possibility that we can see uh, false positives here. Hepatitis B immunization can theoretically help us sort out and distinguish these latter three scenarios, which are really the more commonly encountered um, uh, scenarios. So in someone who has resolved hepatitis B and a waned surface antibody as their isolated core, they should theoretically mount an anamnestic response, which is, technically speaking, um, if you give a single dose of a competent hep B vaccine and, and you check their surface antibody in two to four weeks, they should be able to have a titer that is, exceeds 10 IU. Now, and, and that makes sense. I mean, this is uh, an anamnestic response basically suggests that there's an immunologic memory um, or imprint about prior infection, and that when they're seeing viral antigen again, they're gonna, basically the, the seroprotective response is just gonna keep come roaring back, if you will. In contrast, someone who has chronic persistent infection um, and has lost their surface antigen and just has an isolated core for that reason, um, they're not really gonna respond to hepatitis uh, vac vaccination just because they're, they're incapable of mounting a robust response. Um, the false positive is going to look pretty much like someone who looks like they've never seen virus before, so they're going to have a primary response to the hep uh, uh, hepatitis B vaccine series. The, the problem is that <laughs> it turns out in the real world um, that it is not cleanly, uh, hepatitis B immunization is not cleanly able to distinguish these. And one of the things we've learned at that is that a lot of people with isolated core antibody don't mount an anamnestic response. And it's a little bit hard to distinguish where they fall in these scenarios. So these are the four studies that, main studies that are out in the literature about immunizing HIV infected patients with this profile. And um, you could see here that the numbers of, of patients that they immunize are pretty small. They're on the order of like 30 or 40 patients. And you can see that the anamnestic response is pretty low, um, a lot lower than you might expect to see if, if most of these patients had resolved infection. So they ranged anywhere from 7% to 32%. I would say kind of the median is more like in the range of 20% anamnestic response. In our experience, we, we took it upon ourselves in Madison Clinic to, to test this out and started um, vaccinating our isolated core patients and basically found that our anamnestic response was a little higher than was reported in the literature. Uh, at 46% after a single 20 microgram dose. And what's interesting is that um, hepatitis B E antibody, um, so E antibody, if a patient is E antibody positive, presumably um, this sort of uh, adds to uh, the credence that they've actually had prior hep B exposure and that there's the presence of an immunologic memory. Um, and it turns out that in, in a few of these studies, um, having uh, being E antibody positive was indeed associated with being a little bit more likely to have an anamnestic response. We actually didn't find that the uh, E antibody and those that we were able to check were really predictive of this response. And some of this might be because we just didn't have the numbers to show a difference. But what was interesting was that it, it, it 
folks who were E antibody positive, it was definitely associated with having a higher titer of surface antibody after that single dose um, vaccination. Um, and, and then if you'll notice that um, one of the studies actually looked to see, you know, among their non-responders if they had occult hepatitis B, and you'll see that only one out of seven non-responders in this study actually had detectable HPV DNA. So we should talk about occult hepatitis B when we're talking about this isolated core profile. By definition, occult hepatitis B is chronic infection, but essentially they uh, have lost their surface anti antigen. Um, and they have detectable HPV DNA by definition. What is clear that is that generally this is not a common scenario. The prevalence is quite variable when you look at the literature and a lot of it depends on what population you're looking at and the assays that are used. But if you're looking strictly at contemporary uh, US-based case series, the prevalence in isolated core patients ranges anywhere from around 2% to as high as 10%. I think the true prevalence is probably underestimated because we're talking about you know, smaller numbers of people who are sampled, and they only sampled at one time point in a lot of cases. Um, and and a, a sizable portion of these patients were actually on HEPI active antivirals. So that kind of you know, obviously will reduce our yield there. In patients who were not on antiretroviral therapy, um, and who had detectable HPV DNA levels, it was clear that in a lot of the studies, the levels were typically in the low range at less than 1,000. So these folks are sort of behaving kind of like in, inactive carriers, if you will. But what is interesting, so this is that occult hepatitis B can come back um, in a pretty significant way. So this was a case report from China where they reported spontaneous reactivation of hepatitis B in a patient who, was eight, who had long-standing oh, HIV, wow. got diagnosed in the 80s, looked like he was having good immunologic control of his HIV. His CD4 counts were greater than 500 for, for a number of years, so they didn't actually start antiretroviral therapy. And he, has, he was actually a known chronic hep B carrier that just happened to lose his surface antigen, had very low detectable to un occasionally undetectable HPV DNA levels. And then he showed up hospitalized with like jaundice and sort of florid icteric hepatitis. So this can certainly happen. And he responded beautifully to tenofovir amtricitabine. But, but I do want to say that this is a rare event. Um, when we actually look at the clinical significance, this isolated core profile appears to be a stable pattern over time in the majority of individuals um, when they're retested. This was shown in the multicenter AIDS cohort, which is one of our larger interval cohorts. And if it changes at all, it appears to transition to and from a pattern of natural immunity, meaning they have surface antibody and core antibody that's positive, and then they lose their surface antigen, as, as we talked about before, and that the transition to and from chronic infection with the gain or loss of surface antigen was actually pretty rare. The other thing was that um, it, it appears in most of the studies that you don't really see a lot of ALT elevations, or um, there was one study that actually look, looked at liver stiffness um, as a surrogate for hepatic fibrosis by fiber scan, and it appears that in these individuals, independent of other factors like hepatitis C or lipodystrophy, you, you weren't really seeing these uh, clinically significant findings. So what do the guidelines say? Well, the guidelines basically say that, you know, if you've got a patient with an isolated core, you should probably test them for HPV DNA. And if they're positive, you should be treating them, so, so to speak, as a chronic carrier. And if they're negative, they should be considered susceptible and then vaccinated accordingly. HIV MA guidelines say the same thing. But what's interesting is they, they don't really spell out how to vaccinate these individuals. So this is where, you know, I think expert opinion comes in. You know, my recommendation is that if you're going to screen isolated core folks for occult hepatitis B uh, with the HPV DNA, that, you know, ideally they should be off tenofovir, amtricitabine, or lamivudine. Um, a lot of times we, we capture these folks and they're already on Truvada, so, um, you know, kind of miss our opportunity. But if they are on therapy and their ALT or AST is elevated and otherwise unexplained, that might be a time to check their HPV DNA level. Certainly if they have chronic hepatitis C, I think it's reasonable to check an HPV DNA level because if they're a chronic carrier for B as well as C, uh, there might be consideration for screening for HCC, you know, that's going to change our management. Um, and then certainly someone who's not responding to vaccination, it might be worth checking for occult hepatitis B. Um, when, you, when you think about immunizing these folks, I think you could either take a boost and check strategy, which is to give a single 20 microgram dose and see what happens in two to four weeks as far as their surface antibody response, or complete the series. And a lot of this, uh, <laughs> you know, is going to be um, influenced by practical considerations. Um, you can consider checking an anti um, 
HPE antibody uh, assessment to differentiate whether you want to do a boost and check or simply complete the series. But I don't think the guidelines, I don't think we have enough data to say how, um, what kind of role that's going to play. The key to remembering uh, with immunizing these folks, as with any of our HIV-infected patients, is that we got to vaccinate them early. So don't wait until their patient, you know, your patient CD4 count gets below 350, and always check for an anti-HBS, you know, a month or two after the vaccination is completed, because we we often don't see a seroconverter response um, in a majority of pa our patients, um, and a lot of times it's due to factors like low CD4 count, detectable HIV viral level. Um, as well as other things. Um, so I think I, I went a little over the time, but I'm, I'm happy to take any questions there might be about isolated core antibody.